we're going to talk about climate change and how is it affecting the earth, the waters, our food systems, and ultimately human health. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to start that way and talk about it's a little gloom and doom. It's a little heavy, but there's a lot of information that we want to make sure that we pass on. And then we will hope to end on a high note, a positive note, empowerment, key. What do we do? How do we respond? Is there, is there anything we can do? And that's how we'll end. So we're going to start in that trajectory. So first, I want to talk about on land. Let's talk about agriculture. How and in what manner? And I know this is a big question. That's OK. We can start slow. How and in what manner is climate change affecting agriculture? There's three main ways in which climate change is affecting our food, system, our food production. Um, the first is rising CO2 levels. As you know, that's one of the main things that's causing uh, global warming because the CO2 molecules capture the thermal radiation and send it back to Earth. But the CO2 is also what green plants use to produce food in the process of photosynthesis. So some people thought that uh, elevated CO2 levels with climate change would actually be good for us because it would increase food production. But as we begin to do research, we realize two things. First of all, it's more complicated than that, as you would might examine, uh, might, might uh, uh, assume, um, because for different reasons, uh, many of our crop plants uh, actually higher levels of CO2 diminish their nutritional content due to the process of uh, the chemical process of photosynthesis. They're less able to take up nitrogen from the soil. And another thing is that the other things happening with climate change, increasing heat, decreasing, increasing evaporation from, uh, from plants, transpiration, increasing evaporation from the soil, uh, completely wipe out any advantage of increasing CO2. So that's not a positive thing for agriculture. And the other two things that affect agriculture are obviously increasing heat. It's harder for plants to grow. It shortens the growing season. They have less, they mature faster. That means they have less time to, to, uh, to produce uh, yield. Um, and of course, it increases stress. Uh, some crops won't be able to get enough cooling hours. For example, in California, uh, there's already been a problem with sweet cherry crop. Uh, walnut crops are uh, on, the, on the chopping block because they won't get enough cooling hours to, be, to produce food where they are now growing. So that means those farmers won't be able to grow those crops anymore. And the third thing is the increasing um, uh, extremes of weather. Um, extreme drought flood, which we have here in California in abundance already, but this, the climate change is making these uh, making the level of variability greater. And so the challenges to farmers greater in terms of wildfires uh, in, in Santa Barbara, where I live, wildfires burning avocado orchards, um, and in terms of flooding. Uh, so we have these extremes. All these three, three things are making food production more difficult under climate change. And I'd, I'd, just, I'd add to what David said, I think, um, underscore how significant all of those issues are for farmers on the ground. I think for many of you here in San Diego County, which you know, often lays claim to having the most diverse uh, and largest pool of small farmers. And we do. <laughs> in <laughs> <Number> California. One. <laughs> uh, I in the country. I in the country. <laughs> and I won't take that away. Um, I think it's, you know, it's notable that these are, these are really significant impacts to folks on the ground, right? And I work a lot in the San Joaquin Valley in particular, as uh, David spoke to. These are not small issues. Um, when you look at, you know, the amount of fruits and nuts we produce for the entire country in California, over 40% of nut production, about 80% of fruit and vegetable production in the entire country, um, these are not insignificant issues. When you have more variable temperatures, when you have a less uh, reliable water supply. And we, more variable temperatures, because we were having this conversation before the panel, we tend to think of climate change mostly as it's getting hotter. Yeah. But actually, and we used to, you kind of started to touch on that, but we're talking about extremes. Talk about that a little bit. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, and I think that's exactly right. So this is the, this is the challenge we face. I mean, for those of us you know, I, I live up in you know the Sacramento area, and I think you also had a similar experience this winter. We got a lot of rain this year, actually more than we're used to, and that's great for the Sierra snowpack in particular, right? This turns into snow that then is the reservoir of water that we draw down for most of agriculture, really for the entire state, and that's great this year. 
Now, some of us can remember a few years back when there was a drought for several years and what that meant. What did farmers end up having to do? They looked to groundwater. They pumped groundwater as quickly as they could to make up for this loss. And so these issues about you know, that variability from drought to dramatic precipitation to building up snowpack are very significant to family farmers, the folks that I work with across particularly California. You know, you think about, um, you know, small holder um, among farmers outside of Fresno who, you know, are, rely on a very fragile amount of water being delivered to them through irrigation. If they can't get that, they can't grow a really important set of fruit and vegetable crops uh, for the Central Valley. They also, as we see a dramatic depletion of groundwater, they have inability to actually draw on that groundwater because they can't pump it quickly enough or deep enough to actually get it out of the ground. And so, you know, we look at those impacts. A lot of the folks, David and I were speaking to this, the folks that are at the margins feel this even more, right? Smaller farmers who are less able to adapt to these significant changes, smaller farmers that don't have the resources or the capital to actually be able to buy the new technology or equipment, that don't own their land can get pushed off of it. All these things make that system that much more fragile for the smallest of our farmers, particularly for folks that just don't have the wealth and equity built up to, to survive these you know, dramatic changes. You made me think of something when you talked about the rainfall this year and all of us across the state were out there watching this amazing bloom and the wildflower bloom and, you know, I mean, it was incredible. But we we had that a little bit last year, maybe not quite as dramatic, but then all of that incredible growth and you see it now just driving here. You know, there's wild mustard on the side of the road. There's fennel, it's flowering, except that what happens with that come fall, come right. fire season. Right. And, and so, so, so yeah. talk about that a little bit. We also have the fire impact, yeah. not just directly, but also in agriculture. How is that being, you know, how is that affected? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, I look at the, you know, as I drove over the grapevine a few days ago, I was sort of impressed by how much growth there was over the grapevine. I was also having the concurrent thought of, oh my gosh, look at that fuel load. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the, you know, that's the reality of so much of what, you know, farmers, uh, face in California, you know, we smaller farmers are often operating kind of at that between that urban and that rural interface. They're operating, you know, in more forested areas. We talk about them as working on working lands. Uh, these are areas that are much more susceptible to, you know, to fires when they come. When we build up all of this biomass, that precipitation builds up much more of that vegetable matter, vegetable matter on the soil. We then have, you know, when a drought comes, it actually like makes a dramatic fuel load that can then burn. And, you know, we, we worked closely with a lot of farmers up in the Sonoma area after the Tubbs fire, and we lost, you know, several dozen farmers because there just weren't enough breaks, there weren't enough, there weren't enough buffers between them and actually the, the fires themselves. And they just ripped through, as they did with many homes, ripped through uh, farmers and actually made it very difficult for those farmers to be able to, to build back up their operations thereafter. And so, the, all of these things, you know, precipitation or too much of it, lack of it, uh, the actual building and the up. Inconsistency, yeah. as I was thinking yeah. about as you were talking, a lot of people who aren't farmers, for example, would say, well, we got all this rain this year or the drought is over and everything is great. But is it really? If you get no water and then a lot of water, how does that affect topsoil and farming and agriculture generally? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. And, and feel free to time in, David. I think, you know, the challenge we face is we offer, farmers need to operate on much longer time frames, right? Our responsibility is to build up soil, invest in our soil, because that's truly the, where we are able to actually grow food from, is healthy, living, vibrant soils are actually our ability to So it's like soil is food. alive, right? Soil <laughs> is alive, that's right. You know, it's, you know, it is alive. It's made up of, you know, microorganisms. It is an alive sort of creature, right? And so we, um, this is when we have healthy, vibrant soils, that's actually how we're able to produce the types of rich, nutritious foods that we're looking for. And the challenge is when we have very hot, intense fires that burn across that topsoil or too much water, it actually diminishes our ability to it have just washes healthy it away. soils. Washes away, washes that topsoil away. Or if it dries up too quickly, we can lose it. So I think these are some of the significant impacts of what happens to soil. And hotter, hotter temperatures also mean that, that the, the microbial turnover of carbon in the soil will probably increase I mean, it's good for microbes to eat carbon compounds in the soil because they release nutrients for plants. But when they're eating the, the carbon compounds too quickly, the, can't, the plants can't take up the nutrients, and so it, it's, it's, it's a loss. And the, that means the CO2 is going up into the air. 
And more is not better. Uh, you know, that's the problem. It's like high, low now, it's, you know, gradually getting hotter, and yet at the same time, extremes of everything else. Just a plug for a prior panel, if you want to learn more about dirt and soil or the difference they're in and how many microorganisms there are in a handful of really healthy soil, you can watch the soil panel on UCTV. Sorry for the shameless plug. Um, <laughs> one of the things we didn't, there, but there's more coming. Uh, one of the things that we didn't really get to yet is let's talk about what about the pests, the pests that relate to agricultural pests. We're going to come to human pests soon, but let's talk about the pests as they relate to crops. Talk about that for a second. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, both um, with increasing temperatures, we see the movement of, of vectors that carry um, a variety of pest pressures that are, you know, problems for health, but we see the migration of pests from, or really around the world. Global transportation has actually exacerbated that as well. And I think the challenge we see, you know, as you look in California agriculture is we're trying to combat a variety of pests that didn't used to exist in California, particularly insect pests that are- So some are going up. Some are going up already. And we see that on farms. And they're bad ones. They're bad ones. <laughs> you know, and I think it's important to distinguish their good or and beneficial ones as we often talk about. And we want to build up on farms as part of the natural ecosystem of a farm is we want to build up beneficial predation of insects on other insects. And the challenge is that we've, uh, diminish the ability of those ecosystems to be resilient and to be able to build up those natural predation. And so I think um, with increased uh, temperatures, we see the migration of more of these bad pests. And many of the practices that we practice on farms in particular have diminished the number of those good pests, those beneficial bugs that would actually predate on them. And so I think that's been some of the biggest challenges we face. You know, look at something like citrus psyllid um, here in uh, the Southern California carries something called, often called Wong Wong Bing. Um, this is a hard to pronounce uh, citrus greening disease. Um, it's a virus that actually goes through the tree and um, makes it so the fruit can't ripen basically. So really significant for, you know, for citrus here in Southern California in particular. And it's decimated much of Florida citrus. The challenge has been um, how do we actually try and move quickly enough to address you know, the spread of a, a pest like this? Um, and the challenge is that they are moving more quickly than we can build up the beneficial insects to actually uh, to be able to tackle them. And so what folks have turned to oftentimes is greater and greater use of harmful pesticides, mm -hmm. right? And whether this is new uh, systemic insecticides or whether it's the sort of more foliarly sprayed uh, insecticides, uh, these are pro problematic not only because they end up in our water and our air, uh, and, and hurt, kill the soil. And kill the soil and hurt people, <laughs> but they also kill the beneficial bugs, you know, uh, bees. Well, the, you, you just yeah. made me think of something Something you said is that, you know, we, we tend to take a one enemy at a time approach and it doesn't really work here because this is a fully integrated system, much like the human body, right? It's not one thing at a time. And in case you wanted to chime in, David, and I can tell Kelly is ready to... Uh. <laughs> Anything you wanted to add on that? I just want to mention too? briefly that, that what, what Paul is saying is uh, it, it becomes a negative feedback loop because the more we diminish the, the insect diversity, the more it's, it's uh, likely that uh, ex population explosions of, of uh, negative pa and pests and pathogens will, will occur. This sounds so, like the microbiome in our gut. Yeah, Wait, it, okay, yeah. So and so <laughs> you know, people at UC Santa Cruz like Dabir Letourneau is an entomologist have been doing lots of research showing that that in many ways the right, not all diversity, but the right kind of biodiversity in terms of plant diversity, arthropod insect diversity, uh, all work together and they can create ecosystems that, are, that, that dampen these extremes. Climate change makes all that more difficult. And, and it's this combination of temperature and moisture that you guys are talking about that then expands that season within which these pests, which are not getting predated, yep. you know, no predation on, and you're having to put these additional inputs in there, and they're getting a longer time to kind of increase yep. and, and, and do their damage. Yep. Right, it's sort of bigger, longer, stronger, different times of the year, you know, new and, and different kind of incoming that, that we're dealing with both on the agriculture and also in the human health side. But I can tell Kelly you want to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's interesting as you talk about how these things are transforming agriculture, I see a direct parallel to how it's transforming how we practice healthcare. Um, and health in general. When you talk about diversity of the soil, human beings, we carry our soil with us and we give that a very fancy term which has, is all the rage these days, which is microbiome. 
And as we see um, microbes diminishing in the soil, we're also seeing the same thing happen in our self. And this is creating uh, most of the health conditions, the chronic health conditions that we're seeing can be related back to the microbiome. So when we take these isolation um, strategies to like target one bad bug or to target one bad virus, it leads to the depletion of the diversity overall. So like what you're saying, like in um, Florida, they grow so much citrus, right? It's not a diverse crop over there. So if you're gonna get loaded with a virus, that's gonna take down a lot of people at one time. It's the same thing with us. If, our, if we're giving our kids all that pink um, amoxicillin, you know, we're destroying the uh, diversity in their microbiome and it's leading to increases in challenges with the immune system, allergies, then we have this extended pollen season, right? So now the allergies are even way worse and it's this top down following when we focus on just one thing as opposed to taking into account the whole terrain, we get ourselves into big trouble. Well, it's interesting. There is. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Who was? You? Yeah, I, I think that you know to uh, to wrap up what the farmers said and the public. <laughs> are you health. ready to move to the ocean? <laughs> Close to. <laughs> is the ocean feeling neglected? We, we we are we are driving everything else, right? The ocean. Okay. Yeah. Ah. No, but what I'm saying is that um, in a big picture, uh, this one health uh, movement uh, has been going on where um, you cannot have healthy people when you don't have healthy water, healthy crop, right? And uh, the planet has to be healthy for us to be healthy. And we cannot just be the only you know, species healthy and everything else is dying around us. And I think it's all a matter of balance, right? And we disrupt the balance and climate change has a good role into disrupting that balance. And, uh, and so how we, here we are and how, 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 we can, how can we catch up with it and, and reestablish the balance is one of the big, uh, the big question and the big issue that we have uh, between all the big projects and uh, should we pump CO2 down into the ground? Could we, you know, the geoengineering kind of things. Do we so. capture it in the soil? And it, or it's one thing at a time. Is it carbon? Yeah. Is it yeah. bug? Is it yeah. this? Is it that? One fix at a time solutions really is ignoring the fact that it is a fully integrated. It turns out, you know, we live on one planet, as, as, as it turns out. Uh, we have one home. Um, and I was thinking, actually, as you were talking, there's a tremendous amount of research now in the gut microbiome. And we, we, we still know a tiny bit about everything that's there. We don't know what we don't we, we can't even identify every microorganism and or what it does specifically but we know and we know a lot less about what you could call the microbiome of the soil but the research now that's the new cutting edge because now we understand turns out that thing that's in that handful of of, of a live soil relates directly to our own gut microbiome and therefore our health and so what your point is that this is truly all integrated so i'm glad that you say that and are you ready to move to ocean well I no I, I was, I'll, I'll keep i'll keep you know being uh, <laughs> friendly to my land. yeah okay. yeah i'm staying on land you know <clears throat> but um What's important for, for the, the people to understand is we are all connected through water. If you go back to biology 101, what you study is the cycle of water, you know, from the atmosphere to the rain, the snowpack, the aquifer, the rivers, the ocean, and back up. And we are made of water. We are made of 70% of water. And I think that if people understand that, whether you are a farmer, a fisherman, you live inland on an island, it doesn't matter, we are all connected. The water will do that for you. And I think that with that concept, people will become more responsible, knowing that down that drain, somebody else is living. Whether There's it's no a, externalizing. You know, and if they, if they you know, the water doesn't go to Mars or to the moon, mm -hmm. it stays here. And we are staying here too. So we have to be part of the system. So should we talk about the water a little bit? Well, I think that, well, now you know. that you brought it up, I think it's important to bring in water into the microbiome and human health because this is the thing. In order to find water that's actually healthy for you and natural is next, next to impossible. Right, unless you have you know, an aquifer on your property, you're getting processed water. And just like we know, we talk about uh, processed food. I'm sure everybody in this audience knows processed food is not the best kind of food for you. Um, processed water is also not the best. But we're getting to the point, like he said, because it's all connected, that you really can't find any water 
that's clean anymore, which means the fish aren't going to be clean, which means the plant, you know, so it's this ongoing issue. So if we just focus on one little piece of it, we're missing the whole picture. So we've Shameless all... plug for the sustainable seafood panel yeah. also <laughs> available on UCTV. Um, no, no, thank you for doing that. Go ahead, Dimitri. Please. I want to make sure that people <laughs> understand when we talk about water, that's valid for beer and wine, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Because it's other carrier. You know, Got it. The water is what oh, we worried. use to make. Yeah. Now you should be worried. But <laughs> it, it is fundamental that we use water for everything, and most of our water is contaminated. Well, so and you contaminated just, to a degree that I don't think most people understand. There's pharmaceuticals in there. When your local um, water department is putting out their stats every year, and if you don't know, I'm going to make a shameless plug for the Environmental Working Group who has a WaterWise website. You can put in your zip code, find out what your contaminants are and what filter you need. Um, that, doesn't come to, that doesn't take into account pharmaceuticals. And most of us are drinking hormones because a lot of women are on birth control. We're drinking antidepressants. Our water is so dirty from the runoff that now we have to put bleach and chlorine in it. So these are all things that we need to understand and that affects the microbiome. You know you use bleach to kill the germs in your kitchen. What do you think that's doing when it comes on your skin or coming into your body? It's also disinfecting and that's not necessarily what we want happening. And you just came back from a panel specifically about pollution in the ocean. So you want to tell a little bit follow up on what she's saying. We're talking about municipal water here or drinking water. Tell us about the ocean. It's depressing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to end on yeah. the high note. Okay, <laughs> We're going to get you really depressed first so you just really appreciate half. how high we can go. There, there will be wine afterwards, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Good water. You know, I, I think that you know, it's, uh, you know, pollution is not a new, uh, a new issue. Um, I think that what we have to realize to you know, step back of all what we talked about is how does climate change affect this dynamic that we have with the environment. And it exacerbates what we put in. Um, you know, with the climate change, uh, we have you know more runoff, meaning that we have more pollution going into chemicals. the waterways, more chemicals. Uh, don't get me started on the pollution with plastics. Uh, we know that plastic is everywhere. Uh, how does that relate to climate change? One might ask. Well, you know. Plastic is it's it's a carbon that we it's fossil fuel that we use and all that is part of the equilibrium, and so uh, I think that we need to be aware that um, the pollution effect it's long term, and uh, you know we already tell you don't eat too much fish. Um, some of you in the room might be vegetarians. Um, once very soon it will be like don't eat too many veggies. Um, every pollution is becoming, um, you know, invasive to, to the entire system. And as, as, uh, as Kelly was saying, the, um, the problem is that we are getting more and more pollutants that we don't know what they are. More pharmaceuticals, more compounds that are banned in one country and not in the other. And water doesn't have geoboundaries, right? It just goes across. And then, uh, you know, this has created quite a bit of, uh, you know, transboundaries uh, issues. And this is where we, we, where the politics will come into public health. Comes yeah, and play. so that's, I'm glad you said the word politics, because kind of what we've got going on in this country right now is we have Flint, Michigan, who still does not have clean water. I think it's three to five years later. But we also have Nestle coming in and taking water from indigenous lands and bottling it and selling it. So even though you're right, it doesn't, water doesn't understand boundaries, our politicians do, and so do our corporations, and they're using that to their advantage, and it's, it affects the um, most marginalized communities the most, right? The poor people, the people who have darker skin, these are all institutions that need to be looked at and held accountable, not just on an individual level. Like, it's great for me to say, get a filter, it's wonderful, like, but also we have to hold our politicians locally and nationally accountable for Solve these things. problems on a macro and, level. And I, and I fundamentally agree. I think, you know, one of the things we work with a lot of communities in the San Joaquin Valley and 
know, these are folks that are very much like Flint, you know, actually communities even larger than the size of uh, Flint, if you add them all together, that don't have access to drinking water. And this is years of some industrial farming practices that have contaminated their drinking water with over fertilizer use. And so there's a dramatic amount of fertilizer that's uh, ended up in their drinking water. They can't pump it out of the ground. They literally can't pump the water under their feet to drink it because it is so contaminated. And this is linked to blue baby syndrome and other health effects. This is an area larger than the size of Flint, and yet we still have been unable to provide clean drinking water for these communities, and it's directly related to our overuse of heavy fertilizers and our belief that if you just add more NPK, that we can actually keep growing our way, or, you know, fertilize our way out of, uh, you know, overproduction. And why do we need to add fertilizers? Because we've already negatively impacted the soil. We've and so fundamentally we to... undermined all of those things that you mentioned when you plug the other panel of, you know, the 14 different microorganisms that are in the soil and that we have diminished our ability to, to actually have healthy soil. You know, we, de we have about one to 2% of the original good topsoil left in California. California. We have fundamentally dipped into the reservoir of what was our soil health. And so we're unable to now actually grow things. And so we re rely on these heavy inputs, fertilizers, Which pesticides. Which are expensive and heavy Ex and or toxic. Expensive yeah. and heavy and run by four corporations, really, that, that own all of those inputs. They, and so when you get to the political analysis of it, sorry to cut you off, Kelly, no, is the, the, the side of it is you have four corporations that dominate the inputs that you put into agriculture. And so how do, we, you know, how do we effectively build up enough political you know, pressure and voice to counterbalance that handful of corporations so that we can actually sort of work our way out of this mess and look at building up you know, vibrant, healthy soils so we aren't seeing all these downstream so effects. So we have polluted municipal water, we have problems with the ocean and rivers and streams, and we also are facing a water scarcity. We, you know, notwithstanding everything else, the temperature rise and the extremes are also sort of decreasing our access to water. There's only one source of water at the current moment that's rising, and that's the ocean. And <laughs> this is not funny. But actually, I, 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 there was a, a, sci a researcher, I think a Russian researcher, who apparently got so frustrated trying to raise his fist at the world to get them to listen about climate change. His new research report was entitled, The Ice is Melting and We're All Gonna Die, <laughs> So, which is pretty strong language for an academic study. But uh, <laughs> you could maybe feel the frustration of the person who got there. I mean, we really are like I know this is, sounds alarmist uh, and or alarming I think it's accurate but then like one of the reasons we have these dialogues is to say it turns out that the food choices that I make don't just affect my health but the health of my community and the health of the globe around me and that there's a synergy here whether it's underrepresented communities who don't have water yes politics is the stream through which much of this operates but so is our own personal actions and so it's really important we're going we're going to we're going to get there on the high note to talk about um, you know how and in what manner we can positively reverse this trend because that's what we want to do. We want to stay on Earth, most of us. Like, we, we, we got one home and we'd like to keep it. But I want to talk for a little bit more about ocean, unless you had something else you wanted to say. No, no, I, I, I totally um, agree with you. I think what's important is for the people to realize, um, you know, we have to come to the conclusion that there are still some climate deniers, right? And that's because climate has variability, but also because the climate does not necessarily happen where you are. And so we have to keep that in mind that for the food, the food resource, it's the same thing. In the ocean, the ocean in, of San Diego might not get warmer. You won't turn on into Hawaii waters. You but know, it is getting tomorrow. warmer. It's getting warmer for sure. But people will be like, hey, it's not really global warming. It doesn't really matter. But that's not the point. The point is that, you know, a thousand kilometers far away, things are getting either super hot or freezing. And then you have all these masses of organisms that change, that have to migrate, that have to go somewhere, masses of nutrients that are being displaced, and that comes with displacement of your food. And so um, climate change will have an impact that if you are eating something today, well, that something won't be there tomorrow. And you can try to change things, but people have to realize that it's not because the change happens where you are. The change might happen further away with where you can't see it, but it's there. And so I think that's important to the mindset of the people to realize that, um, again, we are part of this global network of impacts and we are a knot of it. And if we want to affect the rest of it, we have to be implicated in it and be responsible for it. And that's actually one of the, 
one of the positive things about the climate catastrophe that's looming is that, as Paul and I were talking before the panel, is maybe this will, at a global scale, provide, you know, it, it pushes over that, that threshold of, as a global community saying, shit, we better start working, to, we better start working together or else we're all gone. We can't do it. You know, I think you mentioned earlier about how, you know, people can't isolate themselves from cli climate change. A lot of people still think they can. And I think to the extent that, 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 they're, that they become to realize we can't isolate ourselves, we're all going to be better off to the extent that we make everybody better off. So you know, the, farm, the farm workers who are at the front, front line. line of growing food in our California, for example, are the ones that are suffering from heat stroke in the fields. They're the ones whose aquifers are out of the out of range of what they can afford to put their wells down in these little communities in the Central Valley. They're the ones who are, who are getting the, uh, their, their water when they can get it polluted. They're the ones who don't have access to the food that's available. So we have to realize that, that we're not going to be better off unless they're better off. And they're facing all of this new incoming changes in climate and growing season. We were talking beforehand that sort of what can be grown where is changing constantly now, which is really hard for farmers because they're on their land. And you know, that, that's a lot of change. And then we have, we have the disappearance of good pests and help, you know, beneficial insects. We have the rise of negative ones, both in agriculture and also those that specifically relate to human health. I mean, the amount of pest-borne illnesses and diseases in this country and around the globe is skyrocketing, which is something that you know a little bit about. I want to touch on that before we get all super happy on the, 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 uh, the fix-it side. You want me to talk about the talk good or the bad? It. Well, start, well, both. First okay. the bad, then the good. We like to end on the high note. So, you know, there, Similarly with agriculture, there's three things that are really driving this. It's the temperature, it's uh, moisture, and then it's the combination of those two which then increases the season. And uh, as a result of this, we get a movement of pests from the south to the north which increases the geographic area. But you also get um, a resilience of the pests to, you know, they're going to react to the whole system and become more virulent. They're not going to become weaker as a result of this. And so we need to think about this in terms of, um, you know, how we want to respond to that. And when we respond to that, do we want to be broad spectrum? Do we want to be going after all of it? And I know that in some aspects we think of this as, okay, we need to individually, we, we should not be individually targeting, but looking at this broadly. But from our perspective, we actually very much want to look at this from a targeted perspective. And you want to look at individual species, not an overall, in order to address the overall system. And we know what happens when system. you go broad, and we've seen it in agriculture. Right. right. Go ahead. And in health. And health. Yeah. And keep health. going. And, and so, you know, again, kind of summarizing, I think, what, what you guys were talking about a little bit is that this then comes down to even, you know, the macro level, there's, uh, you know, there's the uh, global thinking, and there's the politics, and there's the large companies. But we, you know, what climate change has really done for us is it's individualized it. And so we know that our individual choices, whether we're being conscious about it or compulsive about it, is what's really hitting us. And I think it was Kelly who mentioned yesterday that, you know, we're, I think we're the only uh, animal that's net waste positive on the planet. Everything else is neutral. And so whatever we're going to do to address this, we need to kind of look at it from that perspective. And so, okay, so with insects, um, the way we approach it and the way we look at it is that you have an environmental impact, you have toxicity, and uh, you want to make sure that whatever you're inputting is going to address that. And so the way that we look at it is that the environmental impact is what we're talking about is that targeted approach. You want to be species specific. When you're species specific, you're not hitting anything else. So you can take out, for, you know, for us right now, it's not agriculture, but we can take out a mosquito without undermining butterflies, bees, and uh, dragonflies, for example. Okay? And then toxicity, what we're really talking about is that it's plant-based. And so we're working within a system that is developed over eons, and we're utilizing that and just 
bringing it into a synergistic matrix so that it enhances its efficacy. And by doing that, you, you are highly toxic to that individual species without increasing resistivity, okay? Or externalizing, or externalizing. any other toxin. Yeah. Any other. Although I think it is important to, um, while I think that you know, it's a great option to have to be able to target specifically, sometimes when you're talking about saving like the pollinators, the dragonflies, the bees, the butterflies, we also have to look at why mosquitoes have become such an issue. Because if we're just working on the one half where we're targeting them without addressing all of the conditions that allow them to rise, we're working with this uh, paradigm which we love here in the West, which is either or. And that's not what's going to solve. It's going to be both and. This is so a system as approach. we target the mosquito, um, and this can be in any line of work and any place you go on the planet, you also have to be addressing those conditions which give rise for that to be an issue. You know what I mean? We have to. It has to be a together approach. It can't be just this one iso one thing in isolation. I, I wanted to follow. Oh, oh go ahead. Well, this is the same exact thing in agriculture. I mean, we talk a lot about integrated pest management, which is accurate. I mean, we deal with a lot of pests where we look at the individual pest and we're trying to target, sort of figure out how to address that pest. But if we don't hold the larger systems analysis of building that, those diverse, resilient, individual farm level farms, then we That's won't the get, first line of defense. That's the first line of defense. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, the Just reality Just like the human is, body. <laughs> but it's not either or. So it's finding the individual tool that makes sure we you know, uh, deal with citrus psyllid, deal with citrus greening, and we also make sure we don't have more of them. So we're more resilient in the face of those. And but we're not is, creating additional external problems. But this is also, in the big picture, it's also why Adaptation to climate change is not the answer because if we we can't continue adapting, we'll, we'll lose our ability. What do you mean? Because because the 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 level of change will be so great that we just do not have the resources uh, to adapt to it, and so we have to mitigate at the same time. And humans just yeah. don't don't adapt quickly. It takes you know, millions and yeah. millions of years. Yeah. So well, we're evolution, not but adapt. I mean, I'm even adapting behaviorally. Yeah. We, the, the, the systems will be beyond the, the ability to adapt to the levels of, of global warming, of, of temperature, of, of rainfall extremes. We just, we just can't do it. So we have to be thinking of how can we mitigate. And that's yeah. the good part. Uh, Technology is not an excuse for us to continue our behavior, right? It's what exactly. you're saying is that we have to be individualized about this, which will then affect our greater act action towards things. We can't look for that magic bullet and say, oh, okay, I can, keep, too, right? I can keep living the life I'm living. So I want to talk, I want to follow up a little bit more. We started, we talked quite a bit about agriculture and sort of the impact and we were starting to dip into human health specifically as it relates to food and health, toxicity and health, and just generally health. If you could give a broad brush of ways in which human health is being impacted and or if there are specific illnesses, diseases, or conditions. We got some questions specifically about whether certain conditions have become more prevalent in the modern era. Yeah, so in my work at UCSD, um, I have a, a, a specialization in the GI tract. So um, I consider myself like an earth um, nutritionist because the microbiome is like our soil. So if you see the- We um, used to eat dirt when we were kids, Yeah, right? totally. This doesn't happen anymore. Hopefully you, still, still, do. Hopefully you still do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, so um, the, the conditions that we're most concerned about right now are what we call non-communicable diseases, meaning these are not the ones that are being passed back and forth. These are the chronic issues. And what we're seeing a huge rise in are anything related to the immune system. So um, allergy, asthma, um, autoimmune conditions, we're seeing these things take off like nobody's business. Um, and the, the main reason why we're seeing that is because our microbiomes are being decimated. I mean, you cannot live in this, um, it's so, I was just in an environmental health um, conference and I came home and I didn't get out of bed for three days really because it's, it's just so overwhelming, right? They've done um, samples on cord blood, you know, baby cord blood, 271 chemicals. 190 of those are known carcinogens. We know they cause cancer. So that, at, at first glance, that can make you be like, oh my gosh, what are we doing, right? So those chemicals are out there. If we can keep our microbiome 
and our environment resilient, then we'll be good. How do we keep our microbiome resilient? Biodiversity, okay, biodiversity is the answer to all the things we're talking about on the macro and the micro level. And what does that mean for us? That means that we're eating a variety of plant species as much as possible, organic and regenerative. Um, and that, in turn, the fiber in those fruits, vegetables, whole grains is gonna pull the things out that we don't want. Um, the also, plants are our allies in ways that we haven't even quantified in science yet. All of the resources that a plant has to engage in their um, cell physiology to battle pests, to battle you know, um, changing conditions, we, we call those phytonutrients. You may have heard that term. We, when we eat those plants, we get those. So a very concrete example of that is um, people using sunscreen. Um, we have a huge you know, increased incidence of skin cancer. A lot of people talk about a lot of different reasons. I'm not gonna get into the politics of that. But what we do know is when your diet is high in carotenoids, which are, you know, certain phytochemicals that come to us through plants, you actually act as sunscreen. Your body is more resilient to those rays. So that's part of the reason why we're having such an increase because our nutrients are so poor. And something that you spoke about earlier is we put a lot of um, synthetic chemicals into our soil. Um, one of the reasons why is because we don't have integrated farms anymore. Before a small family farm would have had animals on it. It would have been um, changing crops all of the time. Now we have, if you've been on the grapevine, you see these big big mono, mono crops, right? It's all corn, it's all grapes, it's all strawberries. When you don't have an integrated system like a biodiverse community, then you do have to get synthetic chemicals from these for-profit companies which do not have our best interests at heart. So you're pumping in all of these nutrients that displaces our other micronutrients. So then we are then again less resilient to deal with these vectors, with these, um, you know, antibiotic resistant bacteria when they get in us. So we want to be we want to be clear about that's how we build it for ourselves. I just want to say we do have integrated farms here in San Diego. Yes. And you also represent Thank the, the ones Lord. that you, yes. no, we have more than anywhere else in the country. But mostly that's, club, not, but, uh, that's not where our food's coming no. from in general. <laughs> that's right. It's here yeah. for our local farms. Absolutely. And those are the farms that you also speak for and represent yeah. nationwide. But we're fortunate here, right? And, and the truth is that isn't where the majority of our food comes from. And it's certainly not what we get at the big box store when we buy the 24 pack of whatever it is we probably don't need. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. You were gonna say something about farming. Oh, well, no, I think the- Or no, biodiversity Biodiverse, farming, yeah. yeah. And I think biodiverse farming, we look at, we've talked about it in a few different ways, but I think, you know, at the farm level, thinking about how we're intercropping, how we're looking at how we build up a diversity of crops. We know that that creates the opportunities for, you know, natural predation. It creates the opportunities for uh, building uh, deeper, you know, root systems and soil health, that it actually makes sure that we are able to create the sort of patterns that both make our individual farms um, stronger, but actually make sure that the, the people that actually operate on them more successful, right? And so we know that um, much like, you know, anything where you just do one thing, right? A monocrop makes that farm less resilient in the face of climate change, and that also makes that farmer less resilient in the face of climate change. So if they're only gonna grow almonds and we have a problem with you know, less chilling, <laughs> you know, then those- If almonds, almonds don't work anymore, then what? Almonds don't work. A lot of farmers are in a lot of trouble. And um, that's the problem we face in lots of parts of California. Now, if you have several different crops you're growing, you would now have, you know, it's like an investor, right? All of us, we have a more diverse portfolio of things uh, if we have more crops we're growing. And so I think that that's the idea and that- And integrating we're animals. And integrating animals. And I think, you know, it's something we, we say a lot, a lot of the research we've been doing on farm with some of the UCs and some farmers is showing that having you know actual animals on farms makes those farms that much richer we build up more compost natural manures that replace the things that are missing in the soil and that cycle also of having some animals that that actually are pred predators of some other pests all of these things were the way that we did farming for many many years here in this country and around the world sometimes we don't need to recreate something that isn't that wasn't broken well and i think that's you know <laughs> that's one of the things that challenged and i thought you said this well and About hand it back over to you yeah. is this this belief that all technology is good technology. Or, or bad. Or bad. Yeah. And I think the, the challenge is- It's a tool that's high, right. Yeah, it's a tool. And I think there are technologies that help farmers make more 
in, my, in our case, farmers, you know, more viable, more resilient, those are good things. But this belief that all high technology is a good thing is something we should be wary of. You know, this, this whole idea of monocropping and um, if you think about the, the inputs that have to go in to support that, and if you, you know, I've been reading about seeds being encased in neonics just to protect a plant because they have no natural protection. As soon as you do that, you know, you get the water solubility of it, you get runoff, it undermines the rest of the system, and then you need to put more inputs back in, and you're just exacerbating climate change, right? I mean, it's actually just building off of itself, and it's this virtuous cycle. So instead, I'm in, I'm in I, I may be, in fact, I'm sure I am the only goat breeder in La Jolla, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and our, our goats go and they work at local farms. You know, they, they do the work that ruminants can do, and all of this sort of impactful. There's, there's a lot of different ways to solve a problem. It's not one size fits all. It's not the same answer everywhere. And when we, whether through new tech, bad tech, good tech, try to recreate the wheel entirely or disregard all of our historical, cultural, you know, institutional knowledge and think new and new is always better, then we're, we're really going off and we, then we, we really end up creating additional external problems, runoff effect, impact that was not our intent perhaps. And so looking back at traditional models and ways in which we might improve them here or enhance them there or how to, Another shameless plug for a food tank panel we did last year, but it was about technology. And this one was using specific technology with drones to assess the water at certain farmland across the Western United States so that they could increase the efficiency with which they were using the water on the farm. That's fantastic, right? Because we, we, water is scarce and we have issues. So if we can use technology to be targeted in what we're doing, that's, that's brilliant, but to replace some of our historic, you know, integrated systems, I think, is where we well, go wrong. And, and I would just, you know, one case study of that here in California, and I think we should just all acknowledge it, is you look at the history of tomato harvesting. And so this was an example where we meant to make tomato harvesting easier to release, reduce some of the labor pressures. We meant to reduce the dependence on non-competitive labor. On non-competitive labor. And, it, you know, the idea is that we created these machines that only more well-to-do farmers could then afford of a certain scale. It increased the scale of farming operation, got rid of some of the labor associated with it, and got the, the smaller farmers couldn't compete in the marketplace with now those farmer with those larger tomato farmers. And so I think just acknowledging that while we look for these solutions, to your point, what are the consequences of all of those choices that we make? Well, bigger is clearly not better in farming from from I think my perspective and probably many others. So you know I, I mentioned earlier that this one health movement that is out there so that you know healthy plants, healthy, healthy environment will be healthy people. But there is also another movement uh, that is based on biomimicry. And biomimicry is what can we learn from nature to develop technology that would benefit us uh, without... An, it's a perfect lead-in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> without a big impact on, on the environment. And I think, you know, what was discussed earlier here, uh, it's exactly that. You know, nature has done things for millions of years. Pretty well successfully uh, <laughs> and now we are undoing that so how can we come up with technologies new technologies but that will mimic what nature has done and uh, if we are able to do that which there is increasing uh, amount of pressure on on big corporations that start to have directors of biomimicry on their boards uh, which is a good thing uh, so that we can actually learn from nature, make compounds that are fully biodegradable, and, uh, and try to come up with um, technologies that will keep that diversity, keep everything the way uh, nature would have done it, but of course, you know, you know, in a way that is of, 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 of you know, business-wise uh, attractive. Yeah, it's not about yeah. throwing out the baby with the bathwater, right? It's about I mean, if you see something working in nature, you can, you can study that, you can look at that, and then you can enhance it. You don't, need to, you don't need to sit there and say, okay, we have a problem, we need to invent something new. You can very much take this incremental, um, you know, intuitive process in terms of your development and coming up with solutions to these well, problems. Well, in part, oh, go ahead, please. I'd just like to put in a, uh, an addendum to what you said about, about not reinventing the wheel and, and you know, doing, you know, doing things the way we have done for so long. And that is, the way we have done things for so long is exactly what's led to the problems we're in today. Um, we have 
uh, before the agriculture revolution of about 12, 13,000 years ago when in a relatively short period of time around the world in all, in all the continents except Australia and Antarctica, uh, agriculture started developing and... Here in Mexico, near Oaxaca, yeah? Uh, Oaxaca, uh, Guerrero states in southern Mexico are one of the centers of the domestication of things that we all depend on every day like maize and avocado and chile and squash and bean. Um, and since then, um, you know, exponential growth, you don't notice it at first, it starts off very slow, but eventually um, that doubling uh, uh, mentality of exponential growth catches up with you. and. Um, we have what many people now call the Great Acceleration, which uh, since the, if you look at graphs of water consumption, of, of CO2 concentration, of methane concentration, of nitrous oxide concentration in the atmosphere, uh, if you look at um, rates of non-communicable diseases, if you look at uh, antibiotic resistance, you see this uh, starting at different times since the, since the Industrial Revolution, you see this uh, uh, and especially more recently in the last half a century, you see this incredible increase in all these rates, which, which we call the great acceleration. And I, I think that is, we somehow have to understand where that comes from. And I think it comes from our, our, our uh, approach to all problems of a supply side. If, if there's a problem with, with uh, gosh, we, we don't have enough food here. Oh, we're, there's a problem with climate change. We can't grow this, where can we grow more? Instead, we have to begin to think about how we can actually consume less. We have to transition from thinking of every problem as a supply side problem to thinking of it as a demand side problem. And in fact, if you look at the thresholds for what, where we need to be to, to avoid catastrophic climate change, I'm talking about climate change that, that wrecks havoc across the natural and the, and the, and the social world, we have, to, we have to reduce what we are taking from the world. And this includes diet change. If we don't change our diets uh, to eliminate a lot of animal foods and processed foods that, that are contributing a lot to climate change, Explain we why. don't have a chance. Explain why. Follow, I want to follow up on what you just said about animal foods, processed food. Tell me why those specifically you believe well, are affecting. Animals, we have about 30 billion animals in the world at any given time. We have about 7 billion human beings, but we have 30 billion animals. Every year, every year we, we, we slaughter over 100 billion animals. Um, they take 80% of all our agricultural land is for animal food production. 30% of the crops grown in the world are fed to animals. And just, the, just from, a, from a thermodynamic point of view, that's very inefficient because animals are very inefficient. I'm not saying all animals should be gotten rid of, but animal, they dominate our system. And for example, per gram of protein, a gram of protein produced by a lentil plant uh, only produces one 250th the amount of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions as one gram of protein produced by a cow. Uh, the efficiency of animals is, is abysmal uh, and we, finally are getting to a consensus. There have been major papers published in Science, Nature, The Lancet, just in the last uh, several months, all saying we have to change our diets to avoid climate well, catastrophe. I, I want to follow up on meat real quick, uh, because another shameless plug, media issues, also UCTV. <laughs> but look, th one of the problems is that we eat, uh, we're not out here to tell people not to eat meat. Some people may choose that. That's a personal choice. But the truth is we eat five times more than the UN says we should, twice as much as the USDA says we say we should. We waste about half of it. The amount of land used to grow grain to feed cattle that is never eaten, that is wasted, is equal to the size of Mexico internationally. So the bottom line is eat less, don't waste, choose wisely. So I just want to say that it's nuanced, but I agree with you 100%. And so you were going to say things, and then I want to come back to you and follow up with the processed food. But well, I was, I was just, you know, um, you, know you, you stole my line, actually. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I was saying you know, insects are, are getting, you know, popular now to, to eat, but uh, I think which that's, uh, which are, you know, they are another they are way good. to control the population. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
uh, but the <laughs> waste. Kill them, eat them. Well, the waste, them, eat them. you know, <laughs> waste is a big issue. There is an inequality of food supply. You, know, you talk about the food supply, food demand, sure. But then there is, you know, go to you know the supermarket and you have so many choices, different types of meats or vegetables uh, that are there. You know, you take one and it's replaced right away with a <laughs> yeah, new one. It's like, like the pyramid oh, okay. never, the ends. <laughs> never ends. And it's like, you know, let's consume what we have. And I think that what we produce is way more, at least locally, when in other parts of the world, you know, people are starving. Well, I think it's important with the food, though, to recognize when you go into your standard um, big box grocer, 85 to 90 percent of what's in it is not food. There are these things. Not, not the edges, right? No, they're, it, they're food like substances. So if it's in a box, um, to your point about corn, right? We've gone from corn, which is a grass, corn used to be this big, and we've, you know, changed it, changed it, and now we have flaming hot Cheetos. This is not food. Not so, food? Chick Flaming what? Yeah, <laughs> this is, these aren't food, and these are huge drivers of climate change. I mean, I completely agree with you on the meat front. I think that there's, that's a very nuanced discussion. Um, confined animal feeding, you know, farms, this is really terrible. But we also have to, it's sad that this day and age we have to define what food is. Because if it's coming in a plastic bag and it has a barcode on it, it's probably not food. So the simple message, instead of getting in the weeds and like within my profession and likely within yours and we like they're like always pitting the paleo versus the vegan and it's like that is not the issue here folks we need to be eating food I always think about Michael Pollan's book, which is like yeah. eat food, mostly greens, not so much. You know, it's sort of like mostly sort of plants, yeah. Most yeah, of not too much. Simple, yeah. simple yeah. rules to live but, by. But all cows but, aren't equal, are they? No. I mean, in the sense that when you're well, when you're the talking about your part. when you're talking about your your ratio of lesion versus uh, a, a gram of protein in either or, I mean, how much how much can you reduce that discrepancy by uh, choosing wisely with your with your cow? Uh, not too much, I don't think. Most of the studies have been done, for example, of grass-fed beef. Uh, they have the same impact as CAFO beef in terms of climate. Yeah. Well, so. it, it depends because those studies were not done in looking at the sequestration of the carbon dioxide into the soil. So this well, that's is a very, that's a very controversial issue. We, and, we, <laughs> and we have to be very clear that science, in my opinion, has become very similar to religion. We think because a paper <laughs> comes out, that means it's black and white and it's true. That is you not mean the like case. Ice is melting; we're all going to die. Yeah, that one's <laughs> probably true. But you can find a paper if you want to look up in the literature. You can find a a paper to support whatever the hell you want it to support. I don't want to go wholly down the meat rabbit hole yeah. here. Watch media issues. Yeah. But look, let's. I, what we didn't really get to yet, we've talked a lot about ocean, we've talked about biodiversity, but we haven't really talked specifically about sea life species and how they are impacted or affected by climate change and specifically like the ones we, most of us like to eat like my friend here in the front row. <laughs> you know, how are, how are our fish populations and other sea life populations being impacted, uh, specifically those that relate to our food supply? So, you know, there are different things. So um, if you are uh, an, an animal that can move, mm. it will be very different than the one that is stuck to the bottom of the ocean. And so let's already make the distinction between your oyster eater and lobsters versus a fish, right? So the oysters and the lobsters, um, you know, we all have heard the term of uh, ocean acidification, uh, the oxygen minimum, minimum zones, uh, those are um, giant problems. They are, we don't see them, you know. Uh, it's not that you put something in the ocean and it will dissolve like it's acid, right? It's progressive, it's slow, it's not truly acid, it's acidified, the pH is slightly lowering, mm -hmm. but, we can measure it and we can see the impact on those organisms that calcify. And um, most of those organisms, another controversial topic, most of them decalcify. Some of them benefit from it because there is more um, calcium available and it's easier to calcify with uh, a, a lower uh, pH in the water. But the ones that we are interested in, the oysters, the, movers, eh? or the, the, well, the, the oysters, <laughs> the, the, the mussels and everything, we collect them over the years and they are getting thinner and thinner and thinner to the point where um, eating your oyster, you won't have to crack the shell anymore. You know, you can scoop it up and just, you know, yeah. it's really convenient. <laughs> so 
Uh, so for that standpoint, Everything's yes. Everything's becoming soft shell? Yeah, <laughs> soft shell, yeah. And then comes the big fish, right? Um, the big fish is fished everywhere, and it's becoming a, a, an issue because, of course, we don't know where to fish anymore. And not only there are less fish, but fish move. If you see the changes in, in temperature, in nutrients, and in large currents, you know, whatever drives the larvae of those fish can be impacted by climate change. You can have um, you know, populations that are displaced to the point where um, a culture that has uh, lived on, on you know, hunting or fishing a specific fish uh, won't have that anymore in 20, 50, 100 years from now. And so all the tools that we have developed to fish something some, somewhere very specific will have to be changed. We have to fish deeper or we have to fish in places that are shallower where there is more or less of the, uh, the impact of uh, ocean acidification or oxygen minimum zones, but more of an impact of runoff pollution. And so it's going to be all a trade-off or where we have to adapt. And again, it's back to this biodiversity and, and adaptation that we talked about. Um, is it good to fish, you know, in the large scale and have all those nets drifting? No, it's not good. Uh, it creates a lot of bycatch. It creates uh, many, um, um, you know, a supply of food that is way more than what we need, right? After that, it recycles and it's going to the farmers to feed, you know, cows or to feed other things. And so that's not a good idea. Now, can we reduce that and go back to the, you know, small fishing businesses? Which and is what we have here in this San Diego This is what as we well. have, <laughs> and this is where a fisherman, you ask a fisherman, what do you fish now compared to 20 years ago? Where do you fish that type of fish versus another one? Now there's more and more fish from tropical waters coming in. And, it's but they changing. Have it's I mean, changing. They're stayed in the same place, but what's it's, coming? And it's what changing, and, but, the, but the fisherman adapts. The fisherman says, well, we don't find this fish anymore. We find to that one. But you know what? You know, things, we have developed the gear to adapt. We know how to fish them now. And what you eat in your plates now, it will be slightly different. Which is, which is an interesting thing. So a lot of their folks at your organization are working with local fishermen who are working with local fishes. Uh, uh, fishermen, which is to sort of get people, because we as consumers, we want what we want and we want what we're used to and we don't want to get outside of that box. But, you know, you can help identify, you know, species that are abundant. The fishermen bring them in. The chefs prepare them in a way that's amazing. And suddenly we've changed our eating habits, which fundamentally is one of the biggest ways in which we can reverse all of the trends we're talking about, right? We get back to point A, which is what I eat, affects my health, affects my community, and affects the globe. So by eating more diverse species, by a more plant-based diet, what else? What else can we do to flip this trend? Yeah, so one thing I want to say is that if you look at the food chain of the world, essentially human beings are at the top of it. So we're going to be the biggest bioaccumulator of everything that's going challenging in the world. We raise our bioaccumulation ooh, sorry, status. It's going to go higher and higher the higher we eat up that food chain, right? So for instance, a fish, a lot of people like to eat salmon. This is probably going to be really depressing, but I just learned this at a conference. Why is a salmon high in omega-3s? Because they eat algae right? But as the salmon swims along, they're also bioaccumulating everything else that's in the water, pharmaceuticals, um, plastics. I mean, we're finding microplastics in all of the flesh, right? So it is, and I really like this slide that's up right now, if we're making the foundation of what we're eating, and remind you that eating is the most intimate experience we have with the world and the earth, and we do it several times a day. So it's a huge um, leverage point. The lower we can eat on that food chain, the better off it's going to be for us and by and large, because whatever is good for us is good for the planet as well. So it's not a you can never eat meat like I don't ever get dogmatic. I've been in clinical practice long enough, a long time now to know that there's not one diet that's going to work for everybody. It's just not how it is. And in different times in our life, we need different things. But if we can gauge and most Americans um, are not getting enough fruit and vegetable and the things at the bottom there of that pyramid. 
So we, we just need to be able to, how can I shift? And also, how can I shift policy? Because it does have to do with your circle of influence. It is your own personal choices, but it's how you raise your children. It's what you bring to a potluck. It's what you're, you know, the, instead of having Panera come in at your next work meeting, find a local company that's plant-based. There's many ways that we can maximize our, our circles of influence beyond just our plate, but absolutely starting with our plate. Yeah, I, I fundamentally agree, and I think we sort of touched on this, but knowing your fisherman, fisherwoman, knowing your farmer, I think are critically Number important. Number one. Yeah. Yes. yes. And, you know, USDA ran this, US Department of Agriculture ran this program for many years about sort of lifting that up, and I, you know, I think, unfortunately, we haven't done enough to still sort of demonstrate the value of that, right? We Talk take it for granted. I mean, we most take, of yeah. us don't grow or catch or raise our own food. That's right. We rely on others to do it for us, and yet we really undervalue their labor. Well, and, and speaking, you know, speaking to this, these issues of you know processing and sort of mass distribution, global distribution of food is, you know, making investments in our farmers, knowing our farmers, how they grow, whether they're conventional or certified organic. Actually, knowing them it is an investment in us and our own communities. Well, and also as you were talking about sort of like the from corn to to, to Cheeto or Frito, whatever it is. Uh, but the point is like sort of as you go up that chain toward more more and more processed, remember that the grower of the fundamental ingredient at the bottom is getting less and less and less. And we're willing to pay, we want to pay nothing for that bag. And it's been transported, manufactured, processed, label, advertising, and turned into this thing, flaming hot Cheeto, whatever it is. You know, whereas the, you know, the farmer now is just getting the tiniest, tiniest proportion. And for them, the costs are not flat. The costs are continually increasing. Labor costs, Labor costs you know, are. water costs, right? You know, and so it's, it's really an uphill battle for those who are actually producing the food that we eat that is the ingredient behind the process. So what I'm hearing is that we should, you know, stay away from the process, get local, get real, grow our own, choose wisely, meet our farmers, our fishermen. What else? Well, for me, it's, um, you know, we have this habit that you go to the grocery store, you buy whatever food that might be, and you, you want to pack your refrigerator, mm, right? Okay. The box and, store concept. And it's like, it's like, why, you know? So in many other countries, you go and buy your food for the day or maybe for the next two days. Uh, in many countries, the fridges are no bigger than- The dorm fr fridge, that's right. Like, <laughs> very small. You have a freezer, yes, for convenience, but um, I think this concept that you have to buy things, um, you know, for the week and preserve it, which is the hardest things you can do. Um, nutrients value are going down. Uh, it's so much better to just walk to the market that if you can and buy fresh. Obviously not available for everyone in every community. Of course, and no, and that's problem. understandable. Yeah, that's big problem. With yeah, poverty, it it yeah. is, but I, <laughs> I think that here in San Diego, we have the option to do that. Uh, you have a bunch of farmer, farmer's market, and even if you go to your local grocery store, uh, you might not need to buy everything now for the week. And well, I think that changes everything. And I think it's a, this is such an important point and one that we were talking about okay. earlier, that this is an issue of intersectionality. That may be true for the more privileged of us, but we have this bigger problem in our country and other industrialized countries of convenience. Um, and convenience is killing us. It's killing us. I mean, to be able to, I mean, I see it like you can buy cut up onions in the grocery store. It's in saran wrap and plastic, and I, you don't even know how long it's been sitting there. The, the, it could be, it could, the chance you for you to get food, get but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's just convenience. It's like, give me a break. You can't cut an onion. And there are people who do not have the time because of the cry. way our socio-economic political systems make but it. That's also and right. it's super important because we can sit up here in our semi-privileged positions or else we wouldn't be sitting up here and say, this is what you should be doing, less processed. If you have $10 for your week of groceries, I can guarantee you're gonna be buying Top Ramen. And that is total BS. I'm not gonna say the word because I'm gonna be nice. And that is a socio-economic political problem. And please vote. <laughs> vote and locally, nationally, 
Because, you know, I've been doing this long enough to it know. It shouldn't I, be cheaper than a carrot. No, it absolutely <laughs> should not be cheaper than a carrot. And there are ways to mitigate and work around this system. I'm happy to talk to anybody about them. But we shouldn't have to be doing all of these things to combat a convenient political system that's totally corrupt and a total mess. And I, and, and I fundamentally Strong agree. words. And I, you know, you know I, we are losing, according to the ag census that came out two weeks ago, we're losing over four farms a day here in California. And the reality is that's in part because we're not investing in those farmers in our communities and our local economies. What also means on the flip side, we have a less resili resilient food and farming system and we have less opportunity to bring fresh fruits and vegetables into our schools, our homes, our communities, our, all these nutrients, this depletion of that in all the ways. And so I think the reality is when you think about what you can do, politically is critically important. I think, you know, I spend a lot of time in Sacramento where I live um, and a lot of it is decision makers are not getting enough signals from folks that they need to take leadership on these issues. There is not a food and farming caucus in the state legislature. There is not a group of people that see these, the interlinkage between food and agriculture. And, and justice. And justice. And actually see that as their responsibility to stand up on those issues. It's one of the reasons we created the California Food and Farming Network was we got over 60 organizations together to try and push that platform together. But the reality is we actually don't see people saying, these are issues that matter to me. I'm a legislator from San Diego. These are priority issues for me, and we need to make sure that they are priority issues. And so we need to take you know, cap and trade dollars assessed at the state level and invest those in these ways in our communities to both lift up our farmers and lift people out of poverty so they can actually purchase that food, use their SNAP benefits, their, 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 their food stamp benefits, actually buy food from farmers. How do we do more to draw those connections to both lift people out of poverty and sustain our system in the long run. And I would say that that disconnection is absolutely done on purpose. For sure. This is um, to keep people from engaging in the power that we have as citizens. If you don't know what's going on, and if you're working three jobs just to pay an exorbitant rent in San Diego, you're not gonna have time to learn about these things. And it's sure in the hell not being taught in public school systems. So if you don't have the privilege to know about it, then you're not gonna know and you're not gonna be able to advocate for yourself. So that's why as people in this room the fact that we can take time on a Sunday to talk about these issues. We need to tap our circles of influence and help those that are less fortunate and maybe people who are more fortunate to be able to utilize their resources in better ways. No, but Excellent a, point. There's a lot of... I was just going to say final thoughts from everyone on our panel <laughs> on how to, what we can do within our, our zones or spheres of influence to flip the cycle. Let's start on my left and we'll work that way. Thank you, Kelly. Well, now I feel like I should plug my stuff when I want to go, respond do, here. Do, do, you can do both. You okay. can do both. <laughs> so, so a lot of people are, are, are trapped though, right? I mean, I think you guys spoke to this before in that, so they're going to seem like they're advocating or defending, you know, uh, subsidized food and subsidized production and yet the farmers and the people who are eating the processed food, the farmers who are producing for that and the people who are eating it are, are in fact trapped, right? So it looks like a political group that wants the status quo to be maintained, but this is in fact something that industry does very, very successfully, right? And it sets up systems with the government in order to block or make, give a perception of this is, you know, this is safe and this is a way for us to protect ourselves when in fact what they're doing is protecting themselves. And, you know, so speaking about the evil empire. Now tell us about your private business. Yeah, uh, so speaking of the evil, evil. <laughs> that was my segue, speaking of the evil empire, you know, me and my partners came together and we, we put this company nascent together to address uh, what I saw as being ridiculous pesticide and insecticide use. And in fact, my story is that, you know, I have three little girls. We were living in a part of the world where dengue and malaria and everything was there, and they would go downstairs and play every single day. And you cannot put DEET or anything else on your children every single day. You know, it just doesn't work. And, and the percentages that you have to put on and use, whether it's agriculture or personally, is untenable now. And the, and the data we have that says these things are safe was 40 years old and it's at you know, 5% you know, uh, concentrations and things like that, not at 20, 25%. So that's why we started looking at this and we wanted to come up with an alternative that could, that could work. And so you know, I've talked about this, it's plant-based, it's all of these things. But you know, the more important point rather than plugging this is we went after uh, um, a selection of ingredients 
that when I go out and sell it, you know, they're absolutely inert. They, they have no effect on, minimal effects on environment, minimal effects on people. But the reason why it made sense to us from a business standpoint is that the regulation in place for me to take a pesticide, new technology that I develop, and then get it to market, if I didn't use those ingredients, it would take me two years to get to market. And that regulation is in place to protect all of us, but it's in fact done by the chemical companies in conjunction with the government in order to protect all of us. When in fact what it's doing is giving them a two year lead if any new technology comes out. Uh, so what we, what we basically have... The question have, is, what are the products, just in case you didn't hear yeah. that? So the three products we have right now are uh, an, a mosquito repellent, uh, a, a tick repellent, and a, a, a bed bug But they're in uh, trials product. right now, but soon available to you. So yeah. keep your eyes peeled and follow yeah. them. What, tell us your thoughts about what we can do, we as uh, you know, citizens, as consumers, as advocates, whatever we can do to flip the cycle. Well, flip the, flipping the cycle will be, will be hard, uh, but no, I think- No, we need positive now. Yeah, yeah, but, so, but I think you know, the positive aspect, uh, um, I think we have to remember that we are part of the system and that we are human beings, but we are a species like any other. And that, like every other species, we'll need the diversity. And most importantly, it's education. I have a kid as well. Uh, they are very bright, little, you know, human beings. And they are very concerned about uh, what's going to be tomorrow. And we cannot hide what's going on. We cannot hide to them the mess we have been putting them in. That we've created. We have created. And so now we have to educate them to be um, creative, to live within the processes of nature as opposed to think that human beings are above all and that we won't be touched by any of that. If the world collapses, we'll go with it. Where do we go? We'll go with it. So. Education is important. Thank you. How about you? Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, uh, and I'm thinking about this, um, my father's out in the audience, and this morning my kids were digging in the soil, um, and, you know, worms were crawling all over their hands, and uh, bed bugs, and, you know, earwigs, and other fun things. Um, and I was reminded of that sort of that wonder and excitement and that joy. Uh, we have a lot of kid analogies, I guess, but, you know, thinking about that potential. You know, we think about agriculture is. 8% of greenhouse gas emissions um, right now, but it has a far greater potential to mitigate you know, greenhouse gases. Um, we know much greater than that 8%. And so I really think that I'm excited about that sort of untapped potential, um, tapping this wonder and excitement that our children have for addressing, using agriculture as the only really man-made thing that has that potential to actually try and address uh, and mitigate climate, you know, car sequester carbon at the levels it, it needs to. We could become, instead of a net emitter, a net sequester, a net sequester. And, and by, by yeah. multiples, actually. By multiples, the only thing. And so I think... Watch um, the soil story. Uh, watch uh -oh. the soil story. <laughs> we'll keep plugging. But just to say, that's where I find excitement. And I think, you know, California has been a leader in this regard when he passed, you know, landmark climate change laws. Healthy which, soils initiatives. Exactly. Sure. Passed the health, you know, we, well, first we established cap and trade, which I think we can have a robust debate about but has set up California in the course to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2040 and 2030, excuse me. And so the reality is that we, we can do it in California. We've created programs, the Healthy Soils Program, the Water Energy Efficiency Program, the Manure Management Program that pay farmers, give them incentives and grants to actually do the right thing. We're sending them the signals about what we wanna see changed here in California. Now it's overly bureaucratic, it's not nearly enough, but the reality is California is taking some leadership there and we need even more. And so I guess I would say, let's keep doing the right thing. Let's all get to know our farmers, invest, buy from farmers. There's a great new initiative that was last launched a couple weeks ago um, about actually being able to give a few more dollars when you go out to eat to an initiative that'll pay towards farmers doing the right thing with their soil. Uh, so if you find that on your bill at a nice local restaurant, please contribute to that. 
but then this idea of getting your elected officials to help marshal more resources towards these things, contribute more money towards the Healthy Soils Initiative, towards the manure management program, towards these types of things that reward farmers and send the right signals instead of the wrong ones about what we'd like to see differently. And then hopefully, you know, our kids can keep being full of that wonder and joy and push, you know, the next generation of changes forward. Wow. So I feel like that was a lot of information and how to distill all of that down into less than a paragraph. That's so, okay. <laughs> so for me, um, I think the most important thing that I want to convey is that we are the keepers of our own health. And in so being given that responsibility by whatever force you believe that responsibility has been given to you, we are also responsible for the health of everything around us, including the plant, the planet. Plants, yes, but the planet. Um, so the decisions that we can make in our everyday life that affect not only us, but everybody. And like I said earlier, the most intimately we are involved with the planet and nature, which we are a part of, we're not like we don't go to nature. We are that nature, right? But the most intimate relationship we have is what gets put on our plate or our bowl. Um, and then what goes into our mouth? Because I don't think a lot of people realize that the only reason we are here is because of Mother Earth. What she produces, what even if it's Cheetos, which I hope it's not, um, that is what makes our cells turn over and keep doing what we're doing. So we are a two-legged manifestation of the earth walking around. The one thing we have is a conscious and an upper thinking. So we have a huge opportunity to change our everyday choices, including voting, talking. And I would say probably the biggest thing you can do when you leave this room, I hope, is to connect more, whether that be with your neighbor, your farmer, even your child, your, um, even your doctor. I mean, this is one thing I didn't really get to talk about today, but the way we run our institutionalized healthcare system is a mess. Um, and so really holding those connections that you have um, accountable in all the ways. So please know that every time you eat, you're voting with your fork um, and you're voting with your dollars. But we also need to keep those higher levels because I think that we can get a really focused on what we should do individually. And our government loves that because that means consumption, <laughs> right? That means, oh, you buy a Prius instead of something else or you buy a Tesla. Like those aren't like those are great changes. But we also need to be holding those people who are in offices because we put them there accountable for our values. And that's not happening. And we need to get beyond the rigmarole and the um, blue and red and oh it's so divisive we can't even talk to each other anymore like those boundaries need to get broken down and i hope so in this next election that we can actually start not only getting things that benefit us individually into place and in policy but but benefit our planet as well it's a tough act to follow <laughs> well i don't know what to say now i mean <laughs> My great fellow panelists have really covered the territory. Uh, I would like to, uh, taking off on a little bit of what Kelly said, is uh, not only, you, you know, we, we need to make personal choices. We vote with our forks, but our forks can only access the food that's in our environments. And so we need to work to change those environments. Uh, at the University of California, we have a healthy campus network initiative, part of our global food initiative, which is great. Uh, yet still, our campuses, if you walk around the UCSD campus, uh, what do you see as a food environment mostly? If you walk around my UCSB campus, what you see is fast food franchises, convenience stores full of soda and snack foods and Cheetos um, uh, and plastic water bottles. Uh, so we need to change the environments. We can't, as Kelly said, we can't put it all on individuals. We need to change environments. And there's two, uh, right here in California, we have, a, I think, five bills. Uh, one, uh, uh, Bloom's bill to, uh, uh, for a statewide soda tax has been, has been put on hold now, but there's other bills to relate to reducing the access to sugar-sweetened beverages. You see San Francisco uh, about five years ago banned the sale of sugar-sweetened beverages. Why? 
Why? Because some faculty members, Laura Schmidt, who's a faculty member there, is one of the leaders, and she came out of a conference, uh, a, a research talk, where people were talking about how, sh how sugar-sweetened beverage are driving obesity, driving diabetes, driving uh, uh, coronary heart disease, driving cancers, and she walked out and she sees there's a convenience store selling 32 ounce so but This isn't right. Eventually, they were able, uh, she and her, her, her co-collaborators were able to convince the university that it was unethical for a public university whose research had shown how bad these things were to be making money from selling them. So somehow, <laughs> we have to bring that kind of awareness to our whole food environment. We have to take back control of our food environment. And there's two things uh, at a national level. Am I going too long? No. Nope. There's two. <laughs> ah, I, get, I get off on this. Uh, there's two things at a national level. We're going through uh, another iteration of the dietary guidelines for Americans. Uh, the last time this, this came, this was going through, was published in 2015. So 2013, 14, 15, this process went through. For the first time, for the first time, the, guide, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee told the, the government, you should include environmental sustainability, including climate change. It's not what we eat, it's just not about us, sorry, and our nutrition, it's about, as we've all said here today, it's about the planet. It's about the planet. People are becoming, and this is the good, part of the good news, people in, in the, we in this country are becoming so concerned about the environmental effect of our, of our diets, there were tens of thousands of comments. The largest number of public comments on the Dietary Guidelines uh, Advisory Committee report ever. But you know what? The government caved. Under, uh, this is under Obama. HHS, Health and Human Services, and USDA, under pressure from the meat industry and other big food industries, said, oh, we're not going to go there. We won't talk about sustainability. How can the U.S. government say, we're going to tell you, we're going to give you advice about what to eat, but we won't mention sustainability? Okay, we're now in the next iteration of the 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and there will be plenty of opportunity for public comment. So if you just Google this, you can, there's, act, there's ways you can, you can, you as citizens can put input into this. The other main thing, as Paul can probably speak to much more than me, is the Farm Bill. Uh, we, 50% of all calories in this country come from commodity foods supported by our government. Those foods are the foods that go into Cheetos, that go into junk food, that go into soda, the, the high fructose corn syrup, and so on. 50% of our calories are consumed in these commodity foods. And who consumes those the most? Low-income people, people, people who don't have choices. And they, as a result, have the highest level of these non-communicable diseases. So having input into the Farm Bill is another way, at a national level, we can begin to say to the government, um, we want to take our food system back. We want to take it back for a healthy planet, for healthy people, for everybody. Now I'm in the unenviable position of having to follow that, but I was thinking about what you said, Dimitri, which is education is key. It, it, we, we need to learn about the impact of our food choices. We need to meet and get to know our farmers and fishermen in our community, the people who, who supply us. We need to appreciate the work that they do, and we need to support them when they're trying to do things that are greener and cleaner for all of us. We need to watch more programming like this, no, <laughs> and engage in whatever way that we can. I, and also I would say, take, a, take the time, look up each of the individuals that we've gathered on this stage today and read about them. Look at their research, look at their work because you'll learn a lot. It's the first step toward taking action in your life, with your health, in your community and the planet. And thank you for tuning in, good night. Thank you.